So welcome back uh, to this session, Intimate Hybrids. Um, it's a session of very wonderful speakers, so I'm really delighted to be the chair. And I'd like to welcome to the stage Frida Nake. Um, Fr Frida is a, a mathematician. Uh, he is a professor of computer graphics and interactive systems. And he considers computing science as the uh, machinization of mental labor based on algorithmic semiotics. He's one of three scientists who in 1965 had the first exhibition worldwide of algorithmic art. He considers early computer art as the drawing of digital media, the dawning of digital media, indeed. And his speech, Art and Science in 15 Minutes, is accompanied with this handout, which you should all have by now. Does everybody have one? There are more being circulated. So Frida, we welcome you um, to the stage. I, I even need my notes, uh, which is bad for a university teacher. He should always be able to immediately speak about every topic uh, without any preparation. Therefore, there is hardly any university teachers. Uh, so what I wanted to say, uh, as I was sitting there uh, listening to the speakers this morning, uh, was first of all, computers are machines for computability. This is already contained in their name. But they cannot do anything else. You know, this is an absolute restriction to all computing machinery. Only that, only such functions, objects, that are in a strict mathematical sense computable. And it will never go beyond. It will never go beyond. Therefore, there cannot never be anything intelligent coming from a computer. It's as simple as this. Uh, the world believes differently. But the world is full of ideologists who want us to believe this instead of uh, trying to think with our own brains. At least I am one who is standing here and thank you for having invited me, uh, who still believes he is thinking himself and nobody else. You can imagine when I teach students and I do teach, <laughs> They don't believe me. Frida, do you really think this? And isn't there artificial intelligence? And have you ever heard of ChatGPT? <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> In October last year, when it was first uh, published, made public, it was known, of course, before, you know, perhaps you know, that 200 people were needed in order to develop ChatGPT in the version number four last October. 200 people. If I had 200 people, I would be able to do that also. It's nothing special. It's absolutely zero special. An early computer graphic image is, of course, boring like hell in comparison to what ChatGPT is doing. Yes, of course. But the only real difference is that the technology has developed since then tremendously. No, nobody could 50 years ago imagine what you can do with current IT, information technology. Nobody. That's one. And second, that you can now organize developing some software, piles and piles of people. That's the difference. No. Uh, our intelligence has developed, of course it has developed, because the basement, the technological basement is a different, different one now. No. When my, how do you call these, grandchildren at age of 10 and 12 uh, now do something using their computer, they already do something that when I was 12, 
of age. <laughs> I had no idea of that anything like that could ever happen. No? But that's our technological basis. Okay, too, too much, I have only 15 minutes of time. So computers are the machines of computability and for nothing else. And it's amazing what we are capable of doing with those machines that can do only computable things. And let me say one more sentence. The term computability is a rigorously defined mathematical term. And it was created in 1936 when no computer existed. In 1936, there was no computer in the world. Then Alan Turing defined the notion of computability in mathematical precision. That's one little remark. Um, um, it's also, the computer, a machine of the discrete. We usually say the digital. This is uh, um, fork. No? It's a discrete machine, uh, not an analog machine. We are analog, totally. Um, aha, so human life is much more related to the analog than to the discrete. However, the life of many people now, many of my kind, you know, all my colleagues, deal with the discrete all the time and therefore believe, oh, there is the discrete and unless we get something into a digital form, we cannot do anything. Absolutely, totally wrong. They teach that they are, they are students. Therefore, they believe it, the crap. The newspapers, uh, good newspapers that uh, write about uh, computing and computers, um, also fall into that trap. So I want to do a little <laughs> a moment of enlightenment here. We are in an area where historic enlightenment started, uh, roughly a little further west. Uh, okay, sorry, my time. Um, the computer is a machine, because of computability, of limitation, of limitations, of principal limitations. And it's a, again amazing, given the fact that it's such a limited machine, that it can do so many things. Why? The computer is the semiotic machine. Uh -huh. What the hell is this? Se semiosis is the theory of science of sign processes, not material processes. Those machines that are good for mechanically changing the world have been well known at the height of capitalist development in the mid 19th century, when computers were not around, nobody had an idea of this. Roughly, roughly Leibniz a bit, you know, but very vague only. Um, and then when, in the 20th century, this new class, rough, a totally different class of machines, uh, the semiotic machine, as I call the computer, it's the machine to deal with sign processes and not with thing processes. That's our revolution. And we should be aware of it, of its greatness, but its limitations at the same time. All right, uh, enough. Uh, of this uh, propaganda. Um, <laughs> in the morning, half of the symposium, uh, I was sitting there taken by what these eight speakers, seven speakers uh, were, were uh, telling us. I was thinking, heaven's sake, I give up, no? I, I tell you, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, I run away, I go to the station, no? <laughs> or at least to the hotel. <laughs> but we are at a private place uh, only. Uh, so, but then I, I took a little uh, courage again. Uh, Susan helped me doing this, uh, and therefore I'm still here, and now uh, talk to you. Uh, thank you for listening a bit. Um, what about intuition? when it comes to using computers. If we want to ascribe to the computing machinery the, that much that we do, including myself, I 
um, admit I'm guilty of this. Um, what is the fate of intuition? There cannot be anything like intuition on the computer. However, in 1965, I already told the world, nobody read this, nobody uh, listened uh, to me, uh, that yes, 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 we'll do something with intuition. What is our recipe for this? Random numbers. <laughs> See, uh, this computing is of that kind. To trivialize something that is a fantastic concept, intuition. You know, we do so many things, don't we? Day by day, just by intuition. I believe every one of us sitting here is doing this, and a few of those outside also. <laughs> and we do not know what intuition is. But it works, it functions. And then the computer guys come along. Uh, there were a few girls only by the time. Uh, therefore, I can say so, guys, um, who said, okay, we have a number of random number generators, and we use them to simulate intuition. Uh, this is the kind of process you must, at least you can, if you like, do uh, when you want to use computers for something, should I say creative? I don't like using the word here. I say it only in quotes, unquotes, uh, for once uh, to get a link to how many of us. The computer can never be creative. Not a gram of creativity is in it because it is not living. And our creativity comes from our being born and being forced to die. That's why we are creative. You know, because we want to survive our lifetime. Therefore, in whichever way, we try to be creative. The artists are a bit special here. You know, because they somehow know, a critic has written, that they are creative, this particular person and that other person. And therefore we have a stamp. Somebody, a gallerist, puts up a show of our paintings, maybe. Then we know we are creative. But it's a social process. Individually, we want to be creative. Yes, absolutely, at least I. If I'm the only one in this room, which I would never believe, but if I were, uh, then I would claim, yes, I'm a bit creative. You know? <laughs> and how would I justify this? Just by saying, you know what? In 1963, I did the first uh, drawings with computers. Aha, uh -huh, you did? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yes. Look, this was creative. This was an act of creativity. No, because then uh, German newspapers came. Oh, Anarchy, what are you doing here? Well, I'm creative. <laughs> Random numbers. No, I, I'm, she said so. I'm a mathematician, and therefore I knew about probability theory, which most of the population in the world has no clue of, and therefore I created my own random number generators. That's all. No? <laughs> I was not depending on others, I was depending on others uh, as well. Uh, so, yeah, let me stop this here and I take these, uh, uh, you know, the picture up there uh, and you know the formula down here. And I took these two images uh, to say this art and science. So if, if anybody asks me what is art and what is science, I say, well, E is equal to mc squared, I say, that's science. What does it mean? Oh, I don't tell you, read about it. And then I say, Mona Lisa. I only say the name, uh, and then he, she, that person who asked me, immediately knows, you know, because for the Mona Lisa, you don't have to see. You know? Don't go to Italy or to, to Paris, Louvre, um, and, and <laughs> take a look uh, of the Mona Lisa image. Um, only two more minutes. Thank you, thank you, absolutely. Uh, this is the first drawing, uh, 1963. No. Um, this is the first exhibition. Uh, this is the first mathematician, of course, uh, Georg Nees, uh, who had an exhibition of 
what was called computer graphics by the time, a bit later uh, in February 1965 in Stuttgart. Uh, this is, Stuttgart is the ha haven uh, of, and so forth. This is two of his images, fantastic. We could talk about it, I wanted to. Uh, this is Michael Knoll, uh, the American. Now the Americans would not believe this. New York Times wrote in April, uh, 1965, the f f world premiere of computer art. <laughs> then I was afraid, dear Michael, I'm sorry to tell you uh, that in Stuttgart there has been an exhibition two months earlier. Oh, really? Uh, are the Germans allowed to do this? Uh, these are two works, uh, fantastic. One word, uh, I go one, one minute after, uh, over time. Uh, to the left you see a picture, a drawing it is, by Pete Mondrian, quite a famous one. Uh, Michael Knoll, uh, who often went to MoMA, Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, said, oh, that's nice, I do this here. Now, now he has programmed uh, the old Pete Mondrian. Uh, just a look, just a look. Um, uh, look at How different from there? I don't say how, how, how horrible. Pete Mondrian would not allow, have allowed himself not to do such a clump of things. No? He can separate all the lines he has drawn. Okay, um, I admired Michael uh, for having done this and also for having done it so wrongly. Now, don't mistake me, by the time, because the programming effort in or by Michael uh, to do it uh, closer to Pete Mondrian's would have been much heavier. So that tells us again between what humans do uh, and what we then can do uh, with, uh, with that other equipment. Uh, now I'll show you a few more and then I run uh, down, uh, step down uh, from here. Uh, these are all from 1965. This is done in 1965. Look how old it is. Uh, then I put it up on my wall at home. The sun was shining into that room, destroying <laughs> the art. <laughs> That's the relation of culture and, na and nature, isn't it fantastic? Yes, this is uh, somehow has become uh, quite well known. Uh, this is a bit later, uh, something. That's again a remake, no? 2005, and this year was 1966. So there is uh, almost. No, no, 40 years only between, uh, but now the equipment is a bit nicer and therefore you can do the same program again, no? but with a bit more complexity, visual complexity, uh, no conceptual uh, complexity gained. Uh, uh, this is, no, I have a carpet at home, no? that is this pattern. Uh, somebody called me up, oh, we want to do carpets of your stuff. Yeah, okay, do it. No. I don't remember whether they paid anything. Uh, uh, that was an attempt to do something that you might call artificial intelligence because I only told the computer, please give me a, a drawing, uh, the design of a drawing uh, that <laughs> is done following certain rules and here are your rules. I did not program that anymore. So I step one step away you know, uh, in order to say we can, once we have entered the computing uh, uh, tr uh, tracks, you know, we can then go one step further and one step further and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, this I did nice, it was in Toronto, uh, and that's the last slide I show you. This is recently, five years ago. Um, uh, something again, you know, that is taking up this. Uh, the concept behind this one uh, is the same as here, only arranged in a different way, put into a raster. So what I, with that last remark, I'm three minutes over time, um, what I want to tell you thereby is uh, that concepts don't disappear so quickly. The appearances that emerge from concepts uh, are much faster particularly now, particularly now. Uh, there is no, all that that I've shown you here 
is the prehistory of generative art, the prehistory only. And the prehistory must be there in order that history can start. We are currently, since about 10 years, in the time when this kind of art can actually enter into the world, and it will not enter the galleries and not the museums, because that must be dynamic art, changing all the time, disappearing immediately, and be shown in public spaces. Thank you very much. Professor Jeffrey Shaw, a visual artist known for being a leading figure in new media art in a prolific career of widely exhibited and critically acclaimed work. He has pioneered the use of digital media technologies in the fields of expanded cinema, interactive art, virtual augmented and mixed reality, immersive visualization, navigable cinematic systems and interactive narrative. And he presents us cyber-physical reformulations of art technology. Thank you, Jeffrey. Okay, I'm going to also endeavor to pack a lot in, f in 15 minutes. Um, and just, it's mostly a slideshow of things which I think are related to the topic. Um, but a little bit of, let's say, conceptualizing, just uh, putting together the notion that, that uh, I'm talking about a media art practice that explores various conjunctions of, on the one hand, aesthetic configuration, conceptual articulation, technological machination, and conjoining that with human embodiment, perceptual enhancement, sensual entanglement. And look, I'm just going to show you a, a short text, a fragment of text from a, a, um, a publication I did in 1970. Uh, talking specifically about architecture and imagining what architecture could be, a multi-state, responsive morphology of structure, um, present-day environmental design precludes the user a significant role or identity. An alternative is envisaged, depending for its life and forms on participation, action, invention, and air structures seem at this moment, at that moment, one of the most useful means of realizing this program. So I'm going to show you a whole range of uh, air structures and also point out a sort of position I was taking at that time, which was coming out of art, the art world and out of what the art world was doing at that time, uh, saying, I'm not making things. I'm, this is nothing. No thing. What I'm doing is creating situations of opportunity, situations of opportunity on behalf of the public. So here are typical um, situations of opportunity. Uh, just a second. So this is a, an inflatable tube covered with synthetic grass. Uh, it has a little bit of a land art sort of uh, vibration, and it's just placed in the urban environment without any announcement, without any identity. It's just there to be discovered. And this definitely, uh, I mean, it's uh, not as beautifully printed as it could be, but the idea was that you would have a brick object, a brick hill, and that this brick object, this thing which was, let's say, representative of what architecture is all about, is suddenly a very soft object which um, can be experienced in a, a very different way. And I have to say, all of this is before the era of the jumping castle, of course. And some experiments with really architectonic experiments, uh, an inflatable structure, which is a double 
layer structure, maybe the first of its kind, where there are two volumes of air, a lower volume and an upper volume. And uh, this is the lower volume where you enter. And um, to, to keep the floor of the upper volume in place, these are all sandbags which are holding that, the floor down. And this is what it looks like after you go up the spiral staircase and you come to the upper level. And um, what's quite nice is that when you are below, you can see people's bodies pushing down on the skin of the roof above you. And then also integrating this with, um, with, with multimedia, with projection of film and, uh, and uh, light show and also integrating music, uh, working with a wonderful music group, Musica Electronica Viva. And again, uh, I have to go back to get this. Is Jean-Jacques Lebel, who initiated the uh, the notion that this was also an appropriate place for nudity. A lot of people took off their clothes. Um, the water walk tube, uh, just a 250 meter long tube where you could walk across uh, a lake, the Mashsee in uh, in Hanover. And now linking this to later work, which is also a journey, a walk in space, but here walking towards a projection screen. And as there are infrared sensors, so that as you are walking through the space, you are triggering changes in the image. You are actually walking into the image. You, and the journey towards the image is the journey which transforms the image. Um, another air structure, again, this notion of moving away from the idea of the object as object and the object as just a um, situation of opportunity. Here, the opportunity to walk on water. And then taking this, the dynamic of this kind of interaction uh, to into the world of computability, um, the uh, a bicycle, which allows you to bicycle in cyberspace. Again, the conjunction of, the, um, of an embodied experience uh, being played out in, uh, in virtual reality. So I'm going to show you now a series of different works. All of these works basically express this conjunction of the physical, of the engagement of the body uh, in um, being able to develop the expression of a, of a space of representation. Uh, this work, Revolution, one rotation of the, um, of the monitor uh, will show 200 revolutions across the world since the French Revolution, which was a work made for the bicentenary of the French Revolution. And here, this engagement between physical and cyberspace and the cyber is done by just sitting in a chair, uh, rotating your body gently left or right to rotate the platform, leaning forward, leaning backwards, uh, allowing you to travel forwards in the virtual world or backwards in the virtual world, rotation, rotating your point of view in the virtual world. And this work, together with Plotek, who is going to talk to you after, after me, a uh, work we did together at, um, at the ZKM, involves uh, scanning uh, your hand to get uh, the pattern of hand lines. Um, 
This is Plotek's wonderful architecture, which you call a black potato, I believe, <laughs> because indeed it's just a black amorphous object that is brought to life by both its projection from outside and projection from inside. I can show you how this... And uh, placing your hand on the, the, the scanner takes your hand lines and puts these hand lines on the screen and will connect the pattern of your own hand with patterns of other people's hands uh, that have been that have used the installation before. So basically, you connect your identity, as expressed in your hand lines, with the identities of other people who have uh, have um, experienced this work, have have uh, interacted with this work. And there is a, a tapestry of images which are then um, related to, let's say, different types, different networking, notions of networking. And this was a structure he designed um, for, we, we had a number of mobile installations that were traveling around the world, uh, and these were, um, portable installations of this of this work, also expressing the idea of this uh, web of interrelationship. And here's another peculiar experiment to do with, uh, you know, the cyber physical. Here, um, very simply, uh, you have a virtual reality v uh, viewing device, uh, but the interface for this is uh, a switch. It's just an on-off switch. But uh, to experience this switch, sorry, I'm having some difficulty triggering the videos every now and then. To, uh, to use this, you have to put this switch in your mouth. First, you have to cover it to make it hygienic. And then you put it in your mouth and just use your tongue pressure. Just the pressure of your tongue is what is changing the imagery. So, uh, just a relationship between tongue and sight. I mean, this was at a moment in time when nobody yet was holding screens in their hands. So, here for the first time, you would pick up a screen, and the screen, the mo the the screen would become a window into um, a virtual virtual world, and here is a more recent configuration, and here there is a more complex, let's say, mixed reality, because uh, I've got video cameras in the pedestal, which are looking at the real space, and capturing your own image, and putting your image as a reflection onto the skin of the um, of the virtual golden calf. So you see, you see yourself reflected uh, in this uh, non non-existent uh, in this virtual object, and also this image is in, important because it, again it shows this this uh, let's say intimate relationship between um, the the perf the performative aspect, the fact that it's a a, a body language and a bo an exercise of one's body that brings you in relation to this. Um, the, um, the perception of this uh, golden calf. And this work also talks about a similar topic. It uses the monumentality of a forklift truck uh, to, to tell the narrative of uh, a ballerina on a, you know, a typical uh, ballerina which turns on a little music box. Here, the ballerina is being animated, brought to life, rotated, and you are viewing her up and down as this forklift truck is rotating. And uh, and again, talking about this, let's say, almost uh, ambiguous relationship between material and immaterial, between body and, and the virtual here, 
it, the, the interactor is interacting with another human figure. In this case, it's a, a, a mannequin, a, 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 typic, a mannequin which has been used by artists for a long, long time as a, as a tool for, for generating images. Here, the handling of the mannequin uh, modulates a three-dimensional uh, world which is uh, presented immersively all around you. And depending on how you move, there are sensors in all the puppet's joints, so depending on how you are handling this puppet, how you are interacting with this, with this um, um, surrogate human figure, uh, that's, that is what engages you with the, uh, with the, the virtual world. Um, this work, um, made together with, uh, with Sarah, uh, it, w it refers to a, a piece of Samuel Beckett, uh, The Lost Ones. Uh, it involves um, a six-sided, um, let's say, VR kind of space, uh, six back-projected screens. Um, getting yeah. close, am I? Oh, that's not such good news. Okay, so I'm going to really move through this quickly. Uh, you are looking into this uh, virtual room using uh, shining a, a, a searchlight, a virtual searchlight in the room uh, to illuminate the figures which are in the space. And um, they are auto, they are, uh, let's say they're being animated in real time according to certain rules that are set based on the text of Samuel Beckett. So Samuel Beckett describes the rules, the constraints of the, let's say, the computability of this world, and these figures just uh, basically continuously improvise their behavior in relation to those rules. And there's one interesting mixed reality aspect here, and that is you can shine your virtual torch beam through the virtual room, and illuminate the person who is on the other side. So you have a real conjunction of real and virtual space. See, the torch without any light is moving a beam in the virtual room. You see it represented as a beam from the other side, and the other person's torchlight will then illuminate you or the person opposite. Um, you step on the mat, these people fall. You tap off, they rise up. Um, what's happening here, um, what's significant about this is they will never, ever fall the same way twice. So again, um, there is this paradoxical situation where this, uh, the, the rules of the game are defined, but because of the, uh, the variability of parameters, they will never ever fall the same tw same way twice. The piece is called Fall Again, Fall Better. And this is its manifestation on a big scale. Okay, I think I'll finish with this one. Um, this is a more recent work. It's um, inside a 360 degree um, system which I've recently built at Hong Kong Baptist University. It's a LED panoramic, 3D panoramic visualization space. You have lockers. The lockers are, have got a, a texture, which is the COVID virus. And uh, depending uh, on which locker you are looking at, there's a tracker on your head, you will open the doors for these lockers and you will see people in quarantine exercising to keep fit inside. They are all using video game movements to keep fit. And uh, as you look around, you're basically just uh, opening doors. Um, this is the last work, okay? So this is... Uh, uh, work done for the, again, work with, together with Sarah at the Hong Kong Palace Museum. This is a famous drawing by Giuseppe Castiglione. Uh, the drawing, the horses now using mo motion capture data have, have, are animated and there are sensors which recognize where you are standing, your proximity to the screen, and these horses will approach you 
uh, and uh, allow you to interact with them. Um, uh, and the actual painting itself is present in the exhibition. So you basically see the painting, very famous uh, uh, painting by Castiglioni in the, in the museum. And opposite the painting, you have the opportunity to actually engage with these uh, horses. Okay, not too bad, huh? almost just in this. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thank, thanks everyone for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. So we'd like to welcome Manfred Wolf Plotek. Uh, Manfred is a practicing architect, and uh, since 2001, he's been professor of building theory and design and head of the Institute of Architecture and Design at Vienna University of Technology. He's taken part in numerous exhibitions and competitions and received many important prizes and has written a string of important books and articles. His speech today, Architecture Generators. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I will talk about Architecture Generators and show some examples of my own production, uh, which I did analog and in, di in digital way. Since I started actually studying architecture, the question that occupied me most was how do lines get onto the paper and how do buildings appear in the field? And that's the reason why I mainly dealt with questions like uh, methodology, production conditions, background influences, rules, patterns of behavior, and so on more or less with questions of algorithms, as we would say nowadays. One key insight for me was uh, the fractal geometry. This is the famous triangle of Sibinski. <clears throat> On top you see three starting elements. The generating algorithm is insert three elements into a starting element inside and do it again and do it again and do it again. The script is generating self-similarity. And this self-similarity makes clear the starting element is not important. The algorithm determines the result. Self-similarity is like a bubble. You cannot get, leave it without changing the algorithm. Only if you change the algorithm, you get different results. And this is important if you want to make something new, something different from the mainstream. By the way, a small side remark. This is the Sierpinski Triangle is also an explanation why political parties are increasingly losing their difference today. The input of programmatic ideologies, red, green, and blue, are overruled in the, by the dominant rules of public media, market pressures, international laws, and so on. These algorithms are stronger than ideologic inputs. Algorithmic self-similarity is a universal principle. Back to fractal geometry. This is, in, the, in this, in this case, the starting element is again a triangle, but the generating algorithm is adds three small elements outside and continue and continue. This is the snowflake or coastline by Koch. What I learned from fractal geometry in short is if you want to make, a, to produce a different result, you must change the, the algorithm. And that applies equally to the analog and the digital. I present some examples of my own production. Back to the question, how do lines get on the paper? The usual way is you start with an idea in brain, you send a signal to the hand, take the pencil and make the line. And if the line is not what you desired, you have to take an eraser, erase it, 
and then take the pencil again and make a new line, which in most cases shows again self-similarity. For this problem, one of my inventions was the drawing eraser, an early analog example. I changed the way of drawing. I buried the lead of the pencil in the eraser. When I used it to erase, it produced a scribble. This is generating a drawing, automatically making new lines, even without thinking. The simple me mechanical substitution replaced the linear thinking with nonlinear existentialism. This demonstrates again, if you change the algorithm, you receive automatically new results. In most cases, something unexpected, and you get it quickly, instant, and free. This is not only designing a line, but this is designing a tool, a method for designing lines. This is the shift into the second order. Another remark, the result, the creation is not anthropomorphic anymore. It, is, it stems from exterior procedures. This is similar to the development in art from expressionism to actionism. Another change of algorithm, still analog. In 1988, I renovated and revitalized Trautenfels and imposing Baroque Castle. A new outside door was necessary for better circulation of the big amount of visitors. The question was, how can a new door look like? Again, my basic approach was, I do not design, I just change rules. And I found out the existing usual rule is of doors is a door is a flat element, the turning axis is vertical, and if a door is open, it is useless. For getting a new door, I only changed these, other, these other rules. In this case, the doors are three-dimensional, three-dimensional bodies. The axis has been shifted to another place. It is in a horizontal way. And the open doors become a function, in this case, a stairway to nowhere. I consequently formulated another U rule, which was in, the, in a different place, in a different use. So specifically, not as usual, the right thing in the right place at the right time, but in a different place, in a different use, <clears throat> which is a basic rule for hybrids, which I then applied in many other projects, uh, just two examples of many, the ironing board lamp and the toilet lamp. In this sense, you can change or set up any rule and then see what is coming out. Back to the Trautenfels castle. After the renovation was done, I made a video documentation of the architectonic inventions, which I made. Usually, a camera guidance is either static, John Wayne is riding in front of the, from left to right, or the camera is moving, going with Belwonder and Deneuve from when, when they are walking. In the case of a building video, you approach it from outside, go in and up the stairs. You look around inside, look outside. Uh, it is always an anthropomorphic view with a helmet camera. I changed these rules in my script and said, fix the camera on the moving parts of a building. In this case, on the door of, a, of the toilet. At that time, we didn't have yet small digital cameras. The video shows what has been, what the cameras, what the building parts, what the building parts are seeing all day long. Oh. 
This is a three-dimensional door, which I explained before. This is what the door is seeing when, when it is moved. This is a sliding door. This is the door, the toilet door, where the toilet door sees all day long. This is the toilet seat, what the toilet seat sees. Now to another example, the neuronal architecture generator, which was a 100% digital uh, concept. This is beyond interactivity, completely computer generated. The process is shifted from personal brain into external procedures. The advantage is that external procedures are easier to change than personal behavior and personal attitudes. A spike, a spike is a message from, signal from one new neuron to the other. And a spike train is a sequence of spikes which are firing in the brain. And obviously, the same endless sequences of zeros and ones uh, are the bit strings in a computer, zero and ones, like in the brain. The in a computer-aided pro design program like AutoCAD, Archicad, Rhino, and so on, uh, there are a list of many, many commands, like polyline, polyline, 3D line, square, cube, wedge, and so on. And commands like move, rotate, shift, delete, copy, selection of color, selection of thickness, etc. The concept of the generator was a Lisp program, a list processing script, which chooses from the offered commands on the basis of a bit string of zeros and ones. These are stills from the drawings which has been selected in AutoCAD by some zeros and ones. And this is a video of it. You see, the, you see the neurons firing spikes, and when a signal comes, the, it changes the AutoCAD drawing by the zeros and ones automatically. This installation has been running at the ZKM for more than 10 years, permanently producing, producing, producing new ge geometries. This is, by the way, this is somehow related to mo what Mozart did in his opus 516. His instruction, how to compose a waltz with two dices. He used numbers from 2 to 12, whereas I used only 1 and 2. See, 0 and 1. This was the hyper hybrid generator, a script for the Second Life platform. We have, created, we have created a selection of ready-made construction components, such as wall panels, platforms, pillars, stairs, girders, and so on. In our program, we dropped these building pieces from randomly controlled by a gravity engine. This script continuously can generated new configurations, a heap of architecture, equally generating randomly by zeros and ones. This is deconstruction, not because it looks oblique, but because all traditional rules of architecture are abandoned. There is no more of form follows function and so on. Usually, 
for, for instance, usually corridors are next to the staircase and next to the elevator. And in this case, the elements are dislocated. This was the install installation and show at the Biennale in Sevilla. The, again, the hyper-hybrid architecture generator. You see in the background, you see the uh, generator running, but in the front there is an interesting thing. In front, there is a five-fold representation of one fact. The five, five different representations which are present simultaneously. The visitor, the shadow of the visitor, the, the avatar, his twin of the, vis the visitor, the video which has been tracing the, video, the visitor, and the data of the visitor, uh, which are zero and ones again. So we have five different uh, uh, identities, representations, and this proves that in, in real reality and virtuality are more or less the same. <coughs> Now, for to finish in one last example, Jeffrey Shaw demonstrated already the Web of Life installation at ZKM. Jeffrey was the mastermind, and he asked me to contribute with the architecture of the installation. Now, some remarks additionally to, some, to the architectural concept in, of real life architecture and virtuality. General, the general definition of virtuality is visible but not tangible. And this, in, in, as in the Web of Light presentation, everything was very virtual but not visible and very strong, strong visual. Uh, I did not want to compete and reduce the architecture. I made architecture disappear. I inverted architecture as present and tangible but not visible. Therefore, my architectural installation was something like a black potato uh, in a black background, completely formless, without shape, like in, like in a black hole. I inverted virtual reality into real virtualities. I repeated the inside. Now I show it the inside. You have seen it from from Jeffrey. From Jeffrey, already. this is this is the outside black potato, more or less, the entrance and so on. And inside were these, these three-dimensional projections, which you could see with the three-dimensional glasses. And what I did is that the three-dimensional mesh and web of, web of lines were completely virtually inside. I transported outside and made a mesh of wire wires but the wires were black. So the wires were really here in this architecture, but they were not visible. So it was completely inverted, the thing. But we had problems with it because on, on behalf of security, because people ran into the wires. And so finally we had to change it again and make again red, red lines, red gummy gums, and to, that it can be seen. So, this is a little discussion about virtuality and reality, to touch or not to touch. Merci pour votre attention. Our final speaker, Lucia, is here. That's great. Um, Orazan. Uh, she is an architect and researcher and head of research at ALICE, which is the studio for the conception of space at EPFL, where she continues her interdisciplinary research on the conflict between spatial forms used by politics and the exception, and the commons created by the rebel body. Her work, ranging from scientific production to cultural critique, has been published in many journals and publications. Her speech today, uh, Face at the Deep City Symposium, a global dialogical platform for hybrid conferencing. Thank you very much. Well, uh, 
Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I understand I'm a bit out of place. I'm here because Dieter Dietz, Professor Dietz from the director of the Alice Lab, couldn't make it, but uh, we really wanted to share this experience that we did uh, in a LATSI symposium uh, in 2021, uh, when, as you might remember, we were all uh, in quarantines or with masks or with limited possibilities of being in the same room. We had uh, earned this uh, grant to do a symposium uh, before the, the pandemics, so we had to, to readapt. And so we came up with this um, system that you have here a basic definition. So this plug and play modular tool for hybrid conferencing. The idea was to try to join the physical and the digital. So uh, augmenting both for, through their entanglement. So using uh, architecture in the place that we were going to have at our disposal, which was the forum at the Learning Center here, but also the digital to connect all our uh, global audience. This was a project done with, uh, between the laboratories ALICE and LDM, and it was developed with EPFL Mediacom and the Lausanne uh, firm Computed By, and it's a programmer. Uh, Gordon Savicic. So this was our conference. So in the end, it's true that uh, it kind of brought with it uh, the idea of doing something to just go beyond the Zoom meetings that we were all having at, the, at that time. No? So it was the, the, uh, the title was Deep City, Climate Crisis, Democracy and the Digital. So trying to understand how the digital uh, and the different technologies involved uh, were uh, transforming the city, and especially the city uh, as a site of, of democracy, or as a potential site for democracy. We had uh, an international call for papers that uh, received uh, more than 350 uh, proposals. Uh, Sorry, I went too fast. Um, all were organized around these topics, the data democracy and sovereignty, new digital tools for urban governance, new material agencies, making ground for new negotiations between the technological, the ecological, and the social, resilient cities and territories in the post-Anthropocene, and machine learning and artificial intelligence as new forms of design rationality. Of course, it was not only the pandemics. Uh, although that, of course, had a, uh, everything to do with it, but we also were thinking that uh, we really need to start thinking about moving uh, the end, the audience of this event uh, in terms of people participating with papers was uh, around 100, more than 100. So moving these kind of people for three days around the, the planet wasn't like the best option. So, uh, as uh, we thought that we could link both things. So, as I say, we did it in the, in the Learning Center Forum, which is not usually seen as empty. Only five people each time could be inside that. So it was quite a logistical uh, mm -hmm. challenge because that meant that we had two persons in the technical um, controlling the video and the connections and everything. And then we had the presenters. So it was uh, all the time quite a dance to be able to, to, to do that. And uh, I'm going to show now some images of the setting we did in the, in the forum, which was yeah, our main uh, set, although we also had uh, alternative sets in Singapore and Hong Kong, which were partner cities in the organization of the, of the event, but Lausanne was the, the main one. So we had a series of uh, large screens to really be able to, ha to bring the, the participants probably in, a, in an oversized uh, setting, but as a way of really uh, 
helping make them more present that we are usually are in these kind of uh, Zoom screens when it's a bit of, uh, we usually get lost, no? So here you see uh, our setting. Also this table was uh, designed by Alice, you will see afterwards the uh, one of its role, but the idea does, was that even though we, can, we couldn't sit physically in the same table, we could still uh, feel part of, of that table that acted as a kind of, of common ground for the conversations. Uh, this was the way of being able to set all these kind of face screens. Um, as I say, uh, a lot of technical, uh, it was al almost like a TV set that we had to to set. On the background, you see also we brought some uh, curtains to try and create also some some closure for the for the space. And there you see a more general uh, view. This is the lounge event, and you see this. Uh, Emptiness, but at the same time, now I'm going to, I will show you the, how crowded it was feeling from, from the other side. No? Um, more. Here we see this, uh, the size of, of the people talking. We had uh, several round tables, we had keynotes, we had uh, paper sessions, we had project showcases. So different types of activities that uh, many of them, in the end, uh, were happening around this uh, virtual table or uh, pseudo virtual, because the table was there. Um, and uh, having all, all the time these moderators on site that were uh, managing the whole. We also had an exhibition that we call the, the wall. Uh, walls have had a tradition in, in, in cities as a place where uh, things can be put and seen together. So uh, we've seen that in the democracy walls of, of uh, China, but we have also seen that in, in Hong Kong recently with, or recently, a few years back, with the post-it walls and even like the appearance of the first posters and, and, and uh, announcements in, in walls. In the end, they uh, imply a, a shared experience of reading. So uh, we wanted to do that. It was done through Miro, and it was a way for all the participants to be able to participate with their projects, but also through a shared discussion that was organized from this table uh, during the, the event. That wall also had a, a physical presence in a student installation that was uh, here at the at campus. Uh, some screens that were uh, available for students to write, to put messages, and that on the final day were brought into the, into the forum. We also had a couple of workshops uh, and some artistic interventions also throughout the campus. And how did we see that from the other side. So this is, yeah, you see that. Uh, this is the website that we created with uh, Computed By, uh, which had this uh, map with uh, its uses, uh, the dimension basis to uh, bring together different places. So we had uh, Lausanne with the forum, but we had also uh, the University of Hong Kong and the University of, of Singapore, where we had different uh, events. And this map allowed the participants to navigate, not like every one of these sticks was, uh, is one of the papers or projects that were uh, proposed, so that from the start you get a feeling of uh, being surrounded by all the other things that are happening. No? It's, it's not like uh, we go from paper for, to paper or from session to session, but that they are all together present in, in a way. Um, we had here the possibility of either going live uh, to whatever was happening. So on Thursday, uh, going to also the events that would appear here. 
Uh, so one paper session, there was another paper session, project showcase happening at the same time. Then uh, you'd have more paper sessions and in the evening you would have uh, the debate or a keynote. So you were able to go live. Of course, if I click live now, it doesn't <laughs> take me anywhere. But at that moment, that gave you the, the opportunity of going like if you were in Hong Kong and wanted to see something which had happened in loss and time, uh, you were able to go backwards to, to see what had happened in the night because the website became an, act, uh, an uh, instant archive of what was happening. You could also change the time to uh, whatever you were so that uh, it was easier to navigate. And here you had a more regular uh, program. Then you just had to go to the to the event, and as I say, this was like the moment that the event was finished, the, the archive is there because the video is instantly uh, uploaded and uh, you can go through it. So uh, right now it, it works like that. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm there, but uh, there, so. Um, we all the time had uh, these two live streams. So uh, the idea was to yeah, give uh, not just the TV angle, but also give a, a notion of where things were in, in space, how was the setting, and how was it being seen um, elsewhere. No? There was also the opportunity here, of course now it's, it's not longer uh, working, but here we would have the Twitter conversation around the, around the conference, and also we would have a panel with comments, uh, so that in the end you had this, uh, there was a sense of crowdedness uh, that was present on, on your screen, and in fact a lot of uh, people that participated uh, told us, like, uh, send us a screen, a screen captures of, of their screens because it was like, oh, it, there has been something really beautiful at this moment because this has mixed with that. So, um, yeah, this was uh, how we organized. And here we had the, the, the wall. Uh, it will probably take a bit to load, so I will probably not... Uh, it's really big. Um, was in the end, we had 125 participants with uh, papers and projects, and we had more than 200 people that joined uh, and registered us as simply audience. So uh, it was <clears throat> really, <laughs> in the end, it was really crowded. We were also uh, able to send messages here through the interface so that we could some point uh, either welcome or indicate like this event is happening, this event is starting. So this was how it was seen from uh, all around the world. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, here are some of those screen captures. So uh, you would have the video. Also for the paper sessions, we would have related content related to the papers. Um, you would have the, the comments, the, Twitter account, etc. Um, so this is like a summary of what we uh, imagine this to be. So before the event, it's true that the website serve as a way of event public information registration, payment of the registration, etc. Then during the event, it creates this this common ground for people uh, within and beyond. And after the event, it becomes a live archive of, of the event, no? uh, making the possibility of, of integrating also the proceedings, etc. And that's it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, and happy to be here. <laughs>
by the specific nature of the human mind, maybe, according to uh, Goethe or Kant again. <laughs> uh, uh, but there is um, uh, a question mark which remains notably your um, uh, notion of uh, intuition. I would believe uh, once the, the frameworks and, and, and the parameters uh, are set, uh, and you let your machine running uh, even uh, random through non random numbers. Uh, what you are searching is, in fact, uh, the, uh, the counter intuitive result, which you, you haven't been thought of before. You know, for instance, in the development of, of new drugs, uh, you have a res uh, the, the geometry parameters and, and some functional. Uh, uh, some functional groups of a uh, biological receptor, but uh, you uh, ac acknowledge that you, you, by your own uh, intuition, you, you would not find every, every uh, therapeutic uh, principle, so you apply your uh, computer. I, I believe um, this is a, a contra, -intuit contra intuition instead of intuition. And uh, even um, uh, back in 1997, uh, the most creative and artistic uh, chess player, Garry Kasparov, well, he, he managed to, to win every second party of chess against, uh, uh, against uh, Deep Blue, IBM Deep Blue. But one or two years later, he, he, he lost 90% uh, of the games and uh, today uh, it is uh, <laughs> really uh, impossible to, to win uh, against the computer, but the computer is, finds the, the moves which are counterintuitive and, uh, uh, and this could be uh, also creative as, as you would, would uh, state it. You know, in, I, 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 I have sounds. I believe by the time, if I do remember that correctly, you know, and it is 50 years now, 63 is exactly 50 years ago now, no? okay. Um, I believed I move away from the canvas. Uh, my wife then was an artist, and through her, all my friends were artists. At my work, my friends were computer scientists, aha, so I lived in between. Indeed, that's my word for them, the in-between. Um, that uh, bundles of straight lines. What is a bundle of straight lines? Well, it's probably one straight line and a second one and maybe a few more in order to become a bundle. Now. You may have, maybe not in that short time, observed that there is certain similarity, certain relations between the first line and maybe the second one and the third, uh, and so on. So the secret is, first, my random number generators generate the selection of random number generators now to be used. You know? So I have no idea which one they are using. And for one bundle, there's a secret again, a short straight line, which will become the carrier of the bundle. And one point on the straight line will be the point where the first bundle line will intersect. And then from here up for the next line, a random change and down another random change, and along the line, another random change. So there is dozens of random uh, decisions that I have set up the frame for, but I have no idea how they turned out. And I tell you, you may believe this or not, um, often enough, when I now had run the computer, it produced something, a paper tape, punched paper tape, uh, and then I took that to the drawing machine and put it into there. You know, it was a great surprise what it was doing. You know, 
often enough, it was just crap, hmm? which I then threw away. It was, it was a little sad about the paper I had misused. Hmm? But more and more, I developed a kind of secure feeling if these are the kind of random generations that I will allow the computer to do, to take, um, then it'll turn out to be okay. Hmm? Uh, so you develop, as you do this, you, develop, you, you put in something totally th theoretical. Hmm? I have no idea. And then it runs and it produces something and I believe, oh, that's not all that bad. No? I then ask my girlfriend <laughs> and the others, what do you think? And since they were artists, I trusted their judgment. Oh, Frida, that's nice. No? How did you do it? I have no idea how I did it. Mm? Yes. The distancing of the artist from the canvas. That's, I believe, I do believe this. That's the great change in generating art in our times. Mm? Uh, I do believe you know, we get away from, and our times, post-modernity, is a time from getting away from everything. The conference. We don't come together again. You know? We are uh, uh, around, sorry, uh, around the earth. I was thinking of this. Would I go to that conference? I would not. <laughs> I would not because it would be so cheap uh, just to be online. I had a question for you, Lucia. Um, whether you'd ever do it again? It looked like a <laughs> horrific amount of work. Is it establishing a new paradigm, or which you could commercialize, or is it um, is it really a one-off adventure? <laughs> um, it connects with what you just said. It's true that at the time we did think, uh, okay, this is a prototype that we would like to take further. It, it's true that at that moment it was extremely. Uh, complicated in terms of logistics, also because yeah, the limitations of, of people in one single room were uh, putting an even harder uh, strain in, on all of us. For a while, we thought, yes, we would like to make something so that this is used elsewhere. Right now, I'm not that sure, because I do agree <laughs> that um, we thought that uh, after COVID, these Zoom meetings would uh, become normal, and it's true that they've become normal, but they are still so unnatural <laughs> that um, I, I still prefer to go somewhere where you can be face-to-face -face and, and share the space. It's also true that I do still believe that in terms of CO2 emissions, we really need to rethink how academic uh, encounters work because, yeah, because it, it's part of the whole thing of things that, that we need to, to reconsider now that the gates of hell have, have opened, as, as Antonio Guterres said the other day. You know? So I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Thank you. Can I make a remark? I, please. Sorry, uh, Jeffrey showed you in one slide, you may remember or may not, um, where we saw somebody on a bicycle uh, and facing a projection, a large projection. Uh, that was, for instance, this is where I saw it, um, um, presented at ZKM in Karlsruhe, Center for Art and Media nowadays, then differently. Mm -hmm. I sat on that bike and the experience I made there, I never told you, uh, was fantastic because you felt, you really felt, you are now exploring that space that is obviously flat, two-dimensional, nothing but, and you are biking uh, into this. No, he's a genius. He's a genius for having done this. Thank you. Manfred. Can you tell us about the role of pataphysics in your work? <laughs> <laughs> A big question. <laughs> Look, 
other physics, there is a long development since the French surrealists, uh, Atro, Ubi Roy, and so on, you see. And the interesting thing is uh, that uh, in pataphysics, uh, there are different uh, ways of thinking. For instance, uh, which has something to do with architecture. Uh, the shrink shrinking of space. So uh, normally when you have a pencil and the pencil fell falling down to the floor and you pick it up and when you touch pick the head on the edge of the table, uh, then the normal explanation is uh, that it is uh, gravity and then you are not very, that you are clumsy and then you hit your head. This is a normal explanation, which is not very clear because there is a mixture of physics and, and uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is, no, and Butterfield says that this has nothing to do, that this theory is uh, wrong. Uh, but in reality, it is shrinking the space. The space between the center and the floor is completely zero. And uh, between space the head and the edge is again. Yeah. So this is Butterfield's explanation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At last, it's clear. <laughs> for uh, for um, Madam um, 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 Julia uh, Ozakan, please, uh, could you explain to me a little bit um, on uh, on. Uh, on the map that you have, you have roughly four corners, north, east, south, etc. Could you explain to me why they're so different? Why, why there is a, a ravine on the, on the bottom right one with some kind of Acropolis type plateau that attracted my attention? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in that one drawing? Yes. It's a stupid uh, question. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, random. Uh, I cannot explain why it happened. It, there's only a probability for this happening. And in this particular little collection of bundles of straight lines, it is an amazing e event, a rather unlikely event, you know, that altogether it built that form. No? An art critic wrote, uh, you may even uh, know him, Hans Hartung, um, uh, this is wonderful. No? He, he felt uh, I had tried to simulate, um, uh, oh, oh, I mix it up, Hans Hartung is the artist no? uh, who has done such similar drawings, in fact, sculptures. No? And the art critic believed, oh, I wanted to mimic to simulate, to copy uh, Hans Hartung's work, you know, which by the time I didn't even know of him, uh, then of course I looked eagerly up. Oh, oh yes, he has done some th things like me, so I should accuse him, you know, however he was older. You know. uh, we, we do not know how the ideas come. Um, my, my belief is think the image, don't make it. Think the image, don't make it. Let the machine do it. <laughs> yeah, no, there's no secret. I, I could show you the random number generators. No, no, it happens. Ah. It happens. No, I, I, I can tell it uh, the probability for that first carrier line that I indicated a bit. Yeah. No? The probability for it to be here or there is such and such. No? And then the, the program runs no? and randomly picks it here or there. <laughs> Jeffrey. That's something because actually I feel a strong affinity between your bundle of lines and my bundle of bodies. Yeah, because the bundle of bodies behave in the same 
I mean, it's the same random generator, in fact, which gets these bodies to fall. But what's interesting is that the outcome uh, uh, occupies a different space. When you talk about a bundle of lines, the outcome is an, an aesthetic um, object or an aesthetic experience where you have certain criteria of you have certain criteria of where is success and failure, what is worth keeping and what is what is throwing away. The interesting thing about a bundle of bodies falling is that it never goes wrong. A bundle of bodies falling is always a tragedy and always a disaster. Yeah. And it's just different shapes of disaster. Yeah. And your elements, so to speak, these bodies you know, yeah. are in themselves much more complex than a straight line. Yeah. You know? This is trivial, you know? but by the time it would have been impossible, technologically speaking, yeah. uh, to do bodies. Yeah. So the idea, uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> Let's shake hands. No? I did not know that I'm so close to you. <laughs> You know, these, uh, there is another affinity between the bundle of lines and the bundle of bodies because the, um, the architecture of these bodies is not a, a human skeleton. It's a push puppet, uh, which is uh, basically a puppet with uh, strings. You know, when you, those push puppets, if you push the button, they fall. So actually the interior structure of the, of the body is just a series of, of strings that are made loose and then the body collapses. Yes. And when they got up again, you know, no, none of us would be able to get up like they got up. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so there is a question at the back. We'll take that and then it's, uh, yes, instructions are clear. <laughs> Thank you. So just for a um, if I'm not wrong with the dates, um, the first interactive installations you made were about 30 years ago. And I'm wondering about what was the process since uh, these technologies were not really existing, uh, gyroscope, uh, other sensors you are maybe using. What was your process uh, working with these technologies? Were you the geek person trying to find out uh, possibilities to develop uh, these installations, or were you working with uh, research centers? Ah, um, let me try and understand the question exactly. If I interpret correctly, um, when you made these early works, yeah. were you the deep geek in the computer figuring out how to use it, or were you in collaboration with other um, people and also other institutions, possibly? Uh, um, so I have n no training in any of these fields, so it was uh, very much uh, a process of discovery. And um, the earliest works involved... Um, I don't know how to, to approach this. Look, everything is to do with, uh, with um, on one hand, serendipity, uh, certain accidents or circumstance, and also everything has got to do with other people and being uh, in working together with other people. Um, all, those, all those air structures are a consequence of uh, a close friendship with a Dutch uh, artist, designer, who had uh, discovered uh, these inflatables and uh, and basically introduced me to this language yeah, of, of air structures. And uh, we formed a group together, which was the Event Structure Research Group, which lasted about 12 years. And I was very proud of the fact that, I mean, not, not let's say there were certain very strong um, axes in my own thinking at that time. So again, what I pointed out, no thing, creating situations of opportunity. In other words, very much committed to the idea 
of an art practice that involved the participation and the creativity and the engagement of the, of the viewer, of the user. This was fundamental. And the other was also a question of authorship. Um, I don't know if you know, but there was one group at that time um, uh, in, uh, in South America, the GRAV, a Group Research Audiovisual. And I don't know, the, what attracted me about them was that they used the word research. And this was the first time I'd come across the word research in the context of an art practice. And I immediately felt this was the key word for what I wanted to be doing, that the pr art practice was a research practice and it was a group practice. So from, from the very beginning, we, I formed a group, which was the Event Structure Research Group. And I would say that every single one of these works is in one way or another indebted to one or other people that I've had the privilege of working with. And especially on the level of coding, it's always been partnerships with coders. It's been partnerships with musicians. It's been partnerships with designers, with engineers. And um, the, the, the necessary skill that one needs to develop, I think, to be able to do this kind of work is to have the skill of being able to communicate with other people, engage their interest and enthusiasm, and not waste their time. In other words, as an artist, working with other people, your responsibility in a way is not to waste other people's time with your fantasies. Yeah? The, what you offer has to be something that is meaningful to them and also is, is possible. Yeah? Um, you know, I've, done, I've worked a lot, uh, I've done run a lot of artist in residence programs and the time I worked at the ZKM was really focused entirely on the notion of creating a platform for artist in residence, yeah? And at that point, it was very clear to me that, that, that what's really important is that the artist in residence is responsible to the people they work with not to waste their time, to make sure that, that what they ask of them will result in something meaningful.